Right, good evening everyone. Thank you very much for coming here. I'm Professor Cécile Fabre and I hold the chair in political theory here in Edinburgh. I'm also a member of the Gifford Lectureships Committee and it is in that capacity that I have the great pleasure tonight to chair this, the fifth of six Gifford lectures delivered by Professor Michael Gazaniga. Now the lecture this evening will be recorded and it will also be available online on the Gifford website. So without further ado, I have pleasure now in handing you over to Professor Gazaniga. Well, thank you again for coming out. And uh, tonight's uh, lecture uh, will concentrate on the move and interest from studying the psychological self uh, into the fabulous new science of, uh, of what is called social neuroscience, of studying the self as it's revealed through various kinds of brain uh, uh, science. So we're moving from uh, the issues that we talked about yesterday, responsibility arises out of social interaction was the claim, and that the mind constrains the brain, to tonight's topic, incorporating social dynamics into personal choice, figuring out how out the intentions, emotion, and goals of others in order to survive, and understanding how social process constrains individual minds. Again, those are uh, just sort of categories that have no meaning, particularly until uh, uh, I go through the evidence and, and, uh, and it just sort of frames the, the evening's uh, event. Now the whole notion of, uh, of social uh, behavior is kind of rough on Americans who, uh, who like individualism in, in all of its forms. We went west and uh, the old story goes that when Henry Ford was, talked about, uh, was told about Charles Lindbergh, he says, Mr. Ford, a man, Charles Lindbergh, just flew over the Atlantic Ocean by himself. And he looked up from his desk and says, that's nothing, tell me when a committee flies over. <laughs> so <clears throat> this, is, this is rock to rib uh, center of American uh, 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 culture and, uh, and it comes with problems. But it also has greatly influenced over the years the, the, what the psychological sciences focused on. And of course we have animal models and we were interested in the chimp mind and its limits, but we were profoundly interested in the psychological state of the human mind, and psychology knows a tremendous amount about it, about its language features, about its attentional capacities, its memory capacities, its spatial uh, perception capacities, on and on and on, the emotional capacity lists on. We know a lot about the, the individual person. But what we're moving to is a science of the, of the social mind, about how we think about everybody else uh, in our, from our own perspective. And so in moving into the social world, uh, we can see obviously how utterly crucial it is in our lives. And uh, th this next clip is one of the great uh, social moments of the last uh, 10 years. And now for the first time I can tell you that you're a disaster. <laughs> Я надеюсь, что вы правильно все это поняли. You gotta love him. Uh, <clears throat> but just think about why is that so funny? Why 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 is Clinton uh, so uh, hilariously? Uh, interpreting that moment, it's, it's all about his theory about, of course, about Yeltsin, about Russia, about the politics, about and back and forth and back and forth. It is not thinking about uh, triangles. It is not thinking about what you had for breakfast that morning. It is the whole uh, social dynamic. And um, the, the, the fact that we are so socially alert, socially aware, uh, comes Comes, we come with that from the factory, come, come with it from the room, womb. And two of the people that started really thinking about this uh, uh, that do, and demonstrated that babies had this capacity uh, were, again, uh, David Premack, uh, along with his wife, uh, Ann Premack, in a landmark paper in, in the uh, mid-90s, early 90s, where they demonstrate that young children 
uh, by just using the manipulation of simple objects, you can trigger in young children social concepts. And this work was uh, uh, extended by, uh, by Hamlin, Wynn, and, and Bloom, and it basically tries to take advantage of a simple test on babies, younger, you know, six, six week old babies, uh, uh, 10 months old babies, it, it basically as young as you can get them, you begin to see the, uh, the, the social phenomenon that are triggered by very simple events. So in this example here, we have a, a uh, item trying to go up the hill and this ball is interfering with it. And so, uh, no, no, excuse me, it's the other way around. The, the ball is trying to go up the hill and this object is trying to push it up, so it's trying to help. And in the opposite case, uh, the ball is trying to go up the hill and the object on top is trying to, to hinder it. So it's a help uh, hinder dichotomy. And, uh, and so the this, this scene is shown to uh, babies and the idea is how they come to think about the helping condition versus the hindering condition, and then how they uh, assign value to the helper or the hinderer. So here, here we have a baby uh, looking at one of these episodes, and you can see it uh, here. So you then take uh, babies who've gone through this experience and you hand them the two, the helper and the hinderer, and the question is which one do they reach, whoop, let's come back here, which one do you reach for? And uh, you see that uh, they demonstrate uh, that th the baby much prefers the uh, object that was helping. So, so these are, th these are uh, illustrations of the fact that uh, we come with all kinds of social understanding and we can elicit them through these tests. And at a more global level, you can see it in any of a number of uh, other instances. Uh, here we have an example from uh, uh, Tomasello's lab, and it's self-evident, but it's a wonderful demonstration. What we, what we don't learn and what we just know. But, but so think about this. Uh, now, this characterization that I want to give you is, uh, is a way of, of just thinking about the, the issues we're going to be talking about. I don't know that there's any truth to it uh, beyond a, a, a way of thinking about it. But when a lot of our adaptations that were developed and social process, there weren't many people around. Uh, so you can go back to basically uh, 10,000 BC and there's a handful of, of people on earth and actually a, a kind of a striking phenomenon is that, uh, uh, that, that you can almost say that after 1950 more people have existed than, the, than existed cumulatively all before that time. And so what we want to do is we want to think about this, the social processes that were kind of, let's call them stage one that we are adapted to for survival purposes very early on prior to obviously 10,000 BC. And then more recent uh, processes to deal with uh, maybe the fact that there's 6.7 billion of us now and we're trying to, to get along. And it's rather remarkable that we actually do, uh, contrary to the evening news uh, and other sources. Uh, we as a species get along rather well and only a small percentage of us is, of is make trouble. Uh, that turns out to be very important, as we all know. But uh, basically, we get along. 
and, uh, and how have we come to think about how our mental life is really codependent on others and how we have to appreciate their emotional state in order for us to understand them. And that's what we're gonna be uh, revealing tonight. So, uh, so as we look at various processes, our, the question is, are we, is life sort of ruled by personal rules or are or, or there uh, group dynamics? And uh, in thinking about this, um, again, it's a realization that has come slowly to the neuroscience and uh, psychological community uh, of a concept that you might think of embodiment, that when you are studying, let's say, the brain processes involved in vocalization of, of uh, monkey, of conspecific monkeys, uh, you, we've traditionally said, well, let's study the insides of one brain and uh, give it stimuli and see how it works. But in fact, as pointed out by uh, uh, as if Ganzafar at Princeton, uh, we're actually in a dynamic relationship with other parts of the brain, as we, I've certainly tried to make evident over the course of these lectures, and with the other animal that is being uh, listened to in a vocalization paradigm. And so if you look at the brain processes that are involved in understanding of vocalizations, there's a, a brain process of a certain frequency here, but they're modulated by this other Brain, brain processes outside of that, and those are all modulated by the actual vocalizations coming from uh, the monkey, and in humans, also the uh, actual uh, uh, musculature, uh, uh, musculatures of the mouth. So we we're, we're have to look at the whole picture as the point of this. We, we can't look anymore in isolation at just the, the psychological moment. And uh, as our brains grew, there's a dominant, uh, a prevalent, I wouldn't say dominant, prevalent theory about that one of the things that motivated us to get these large brains that we're carrying around is the fact of our social world. That uh, when we start to look at the fact that we have these uh, enormous brains, it correlates with our click size, with the number of people we have to deal with socially. And since we have the largest uh, size uh, in the, um, amongst the primates, the thought is that we needed a larger brain to keep track of all the things that people have to keep track of as they, their relationships grow with all the complexities of uh, dealing with, with all the people at hand. And so information about social relationship requires additional processing capacity as well as specific specializations. That seems to underlie maybe the growth in the, the brain that we have seen. Okay, well, before we, we sell, tell the brain side, uh, let's look at the, what we're, I'm gonna call the, the psychosocial dimension. There's a lot of things going on in an evolutionary sweep, and you don't want to just concentrate on one at the cost of not taking into account all the other dimensions uh, that are going on. And uh, I had the privilege uh, a number of years ago to be a part of a small study group uh, that uh, Leon Festinger put together, and it, it was uh, uh, sort of reported out. That's not the right way to do it. It's completely his creative work. Uh, in this, this book, The Human Legacy, Legacy which I, I highly recommend to you. And in that group was uh, David Premack, uh, the infinitely creative psychologist we're gonna keep hearing more about throughout these lectures, uh, Stan Schachter, the social psychologist, and, and myself. And what, what we did was, uh, we, 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 uh, Leon took us all over the world in, in, in the Negev, in the south of France, and looked at lithic technologists, and oh, it was just a wonderful uh, experience. And he finally tried to capture what was going on that may be accountable for the fantastic vastness uh, and difference between us and, and other species. And the one point that he thought triggered so much was sedentary living. So the way it was captured was between 10,500 and 8,500, an accumulation of little things, as he put it, made a major change in lifestyle possible, namely becoming sedentary. So there was more effective hunting developed, the domestication of the dog, the increased consumption of fish, the greater reliance on storable cereal grains. All of these things led to being able to stay put instead of continuing, being, uh, continuing to be nomadic. And, more, and during that time, also more judicious uh, choice of, of living sites. So Festinger put that together, and he said, came up with the idea that sedentary existence was the fundamental change that irreversibly altered the course of human evolution. And, and why? He says, group size quickly increased to around 
150. Uh, and with that group size, lots of things followed from it. Why? Well, uh, in a sedentary life, humans can reproduce more successfully due to a reduction of miscarriages and a reduction of spacing between children. And normally, the environment and natural resources temper the population increase by the endogenous drive to reproduce and other animals. Uh, but in humans, not so. The human is able sooner or later to find or invent solutions to problems. So we were inventing solutions and changing our environments while we are evolving. And uh, so he sums it up that in, from 9,000 to se uh, sedentary groups formed, and then 7,000 agricultural came along, and then there were specializations that required more inter interdependence in communities. And, uh, and then there was the development of n both natural technologies, like the making of fire and using it in all kinds of situations, the making of rain, and also the development of religious, religious technologies, all to control uh, the fact that you have these uh, groups that have, have to be managed. So in the Festinger Cascade, as I call it, you have sedentary life, population growth, inventiveness, the natural and religious technology, social rules, moral stance evolves, and what's happening now? What is it? I don't know. But that, that is, that is, the point of that is that there's also, in addition to these incredible things we're finding about what's built in, there's this whole environment that's changing, that's impacting uh, us and, the, and perhaps also our, our genome. So we're gonna look at stage one. Social primitives were largely intact before sedentary life. Sedentary life and subsequent civilization provided the venue in which the social brain flourished. And then there's a stage two, I'm gonna call it, of coevolution with emerging civilization continued to say, to shape social components of the human brain. So we're gonna look at the primitives and then look at also the second, second stage. And we should just see right off the bat, how, well, how could that work, that stage two you're talking about? And there's a, there's a long-term uh, effect that's known from an American psychologist called the, the Baldwin effect. And here's this possible it's a possible mechanism to see how downward, downward causation that we talked about yesterday uh, could work in the social sphere. The Baldwin effect was first reviewed here as, as a Gifford lecture by C.H. Waddington. He was a big believer in it. And it's basically uh, the ostrich serves as an example. The ostrich has, has these rather bony and thick uh, tissued uh, knees. And the question is, uh, how did they come about? Well, they came about by the ostrich, when the ostrich had to bend down to, eat food, the, the animals in the population that were better prepared for that, their skin uh, had the resources to start laying over and thickening up. The ones that could move that faster along would finally evolve to just have, have that. So now ostriches are born with this phenomenon uh, of, of the uh, uh, improved and hardened knee. And so it's put recently uh, in another context with the same idea, the same issue by Krubitzer and Koss. A particular phenotypic characteristic that is optimal for a given environment, fixing the knees, into the, uh, can become incorporated into the genome over successive generations by endowing a selective advantage to those individuals who, who display these optimal characteristics and who have a strong correlation between the genotype and phenotype space. So that's just a formal way of saying what the Bal uh, Baldwin effect is. So what you have, <coughs> is now, well, maybe things are caught in the social world, and, and maybe the people who best respond to the social rules that are emerging, or the social practices that are emerging, are selected for, and therefore it's, it's encouraged. And uh, these things happen. The fascinating work of uh, Jessica Flack at, at the Santa Fe Institute, and prior to that at Emory University, has demonstrated that amongst primates, for example, primate uh, uh, cliques, that uh, a, a policeman basically emerges from the social group. And this policeman, uh, and they can identify this policeman, uh, <laughs> a monkey policeman, uh, by uh, various methods of measuring uh, who grimaces at whom and how long and this sort of thing. But she uh, did a very uh, careful study and showed that uh, if the policeman was in 
a group, there was far reduction, a great reduction in violence and chaos. And if the policemen were removed, uh, there was uh, there were these uh, violent events. So all the policemen had to do was sort of walk over to where the guys were having beer and about ready to slug each other. And the policeman stands there, and guess what? They don't slug each other. So apparently the same thing goes on in uh, the world of the, of the primate. So one could see how if such a thing emerged that you could then see it feeding back down and, and, and biasing subsequent generations to be respectful of that. So as Gordon Alport, Alport said, socialized behavior is the supreme achievement of the cortex. Gordon Alport was the great social psychologist uh, at Harvard University for many years. And think about it, he's right. When is the last moment in time when you were not thinking about something social? Right? That's all you do all day long, is you're thinking about how other people are thinking, what's their intentions, how is that going to apply to you, what's your boss thinking, did I get paid enough, is, does she like me, does he like me, da, 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 da. drives you crazy. You don't sit around and think about triangles. So <clears throat> here we go. This field has captured this, uh, and of course the social process is a, is a distinguished field of intellectual work. Uh, at a psychological level and social psychological work, but now, because of these things we've talked about over the last few days, they can be studied and examined, questions can be examined with the new uh, uh, brain imaging technologies, and further, I think, insights uh, can be made. And so, again, we go back to uh, the issue of understanding others, and we go back to the, uh, the uh, work, the seminal work of uh, David Premack, who uh, is, I think, one of the world's, uh, has been one of the world's greatest psychologists. And Premack, uh, many years ago, uh, had a chimp facility, which you see here in Honeybrook, out, uh, out past uh, 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 Philadelphia. And it was in Amish country. And uh, there he had the chimps in observation, and he would uh, stand uh, or sit in his office, and various experiments would be run in the natural field in front. And he's, he did any of a number of, 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 of hundreds of, of experiments. But he came up with a fundamental idea that governs so much of uh, social, psychological, social neuroscience work. And that is called uh, theory of mind research. And what it amounts to is you have a theory about your dog, but your dog does not have a theory about you. I hate to break the news to you, but that's the truth. And it turns out the chimp doesn't have a theory about you either. You have a theory about the chimp. In fact, you have a theory about anything that moves that looks remotely human. And even things that aren't human, you develop a theory about it. You have a theory in your mind about the intentions, the, the stance, the mental operations of the other person. Now, uh, you can demonstrate this about the, our reflexive theory of others. This is a common experience a student sees the the robot at MIT's Cognitive Science Lab uh, called COG, and it has a couple of eyes, and it has the ability to move its face. And you're in the room in minutes, seconds, they say, actually. You have, think that this is a person. You, he's animated. You've assigned it a name. You, you, when, it, when you move and it looks and tracks you in the room, it kind of spooks you out a little bit. But in fact, there you are. You've, you, have developed and mapped some kind of agency on this thing. So what you do is you have a theory about it, and then anything it does, any little move, it triggers in your mind this theory you have about this. So if it looks away, you say, why is he looking away, and so forth and so on. And uh, you can see, once you, you understand the power of, of this thing that we carry around, this theory of mind that we reflexively use on, on everything almost, uh, you can see why the life-death decisions uh, in such uh, cases where you have a central brain death but a heart beating, uh, that's uh, easy to say, but it's very hard for the, the uh, loved ones to accept it. And the reason is the mental model of others lives in our minds and does not die when they die. We have the mind. That's the cost uh, in, in death is, the, is not the person is dead. But we have these models. That's how we think of people. We go through these models in our head. And since we're alive, they're, they're very much alive. So, uh, so how, how, do we, 
how, how do we try to think about how our brain came to this state and how we came to that state and becoming empathetic and all the rest. And we're going to look at the question of understanding others by mirroring, what we call mirroring, I'll make that clear, inner imitation and feeling your pain and feeling your thoughts. So uh, what, what do I mean by all that? Um, one of the great discoveries of the last uh, 20 years was made by uh, Giacomo Rezzolatti at uh, Parma in Italy. And uh, uh, Rezzolatti discovered something that are called mirror neurons. And he discovered them in the, studying the primate. And the notion was he, saw, he began to see the cortical origins for how uh, an animal could appreciate the state of another. And uh, in his initial experiment, a uh, classic experiment, a monkey would grasp, would reach out to grasp a grape, say. And uh, he would be recording from a part of the prefrontal lobes. And uh, the monkey would, the, the cells would not respond uh, during the movement. This didn't have any effect on the cells he was recording from. They only responded when they went to grasp the grape. So it was just uh, only when, when they hit. And, and so the, 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 these were called grasp neurons and all the rest of it. But what, what he did that was so astounding was show that he had, while he had found a, a neural activity that correlated with the, the animal itself reaching for a grape, the animal could just be sitting there and then a human could reach for the same grape and the neurons go crazy. So the animal has captured grasping in the, in the external world of another agent and now knows the meaning of it with respect to himself. And, uh, and Dr. Rezzolati, uh, uh, I saw the, this short uh, bit of film that uh, his laboratory and his colleagues uh, produced and I asked if I could uh, show that here because it's so compelling. And uh, he, he uh, wonderfully obliged, and so here it is. So here, there you hear the neuron firing as the monkey grasps the grape. And un altro così. Come prima, tirino. Ancora. Who would have thought to do that? You get the idea. So, so this fundamental discovery that there was a, perhaps a, the cortical substrate uh, coming along already in, in the macaque for understanding and appreciating others has uh, evolved in, in many hands and, and one way of thinking about it is something called uh, simulation theory, where you simulate in your head what's going on in somebody else. And uh, this has now been demonstrated in any of a number of situations. Uh, the work of Jackson, Meltzoff, and D-City is, is a, a particular note here, where they were studying uh, normal students in a brain imaging environment, where what they did was um, they, they first worked out uh, how the brain, how the, what brain areas would be involved as people actually experience pain of varying magnitude. So you would, you would uh, you, this is usually done by having a probe go on the hand that's either neutral or it gets colder or gets hotter. And, and, uh, and so there's a pain mechanism that's associated with it as you increase the intensity of it, the amplitude of the response in the brain grows. So you see this, you capture it, you know, you know where the pain systems are. Then they cleverly switched the experiments and they just showed films of people experiencing pain of the varying types. And then they look for the brain responses in those people. They're not actually having physical pain. They're simply experiencing a movie where somebody is having it. And what they find is the exact same brain areas light up and are active in that case versus the actual pain case. So this is supportive of the notion that how we come to understand the feelings of others is literally to simulate their states in ourselves and that cues us as to how we feel. And uh, there's behavioral work on this where 
in, uh, this is more just behavioral. If you watch a movie, this is a scene from the movie uh, uh, Raging Bull, I think it is. And here's a video <coughs> taken of a student watching the movie. And then as, the, as the, the actor gets hit there, the woman just begins to adopt the actual posture uh, of the pain uh, and uh, of the event of the violence to try to understand. And this is shown over and over again. So uh, not only do we mirror it, but then once we mirror it, uh, and, and we, we also imitate. And this is a tremendous way that things get transmitted amongst our species. And it starts early in the chimpanzee. I'm gonna, in fact, our problem, the problem with the humans is that we're over uh, imitators. We imitate uh, too much. But uh, it starts in, in the chimp, and here's a, a wonderful demonstration of it, and followed by a human uh, example that you'll find uh, interesting, I think. To prove that one ape can copy another, a student of Andrew Whiten's devised an experiment. At the University of Texas, Antoine Spiteri has built a kind of slot machine for apes. He loads it with a grape. To get the fruit, a chimp must first turn a disc to allow the grape to drop through a hole. Next, a chimp must move a door that opens a handle to release the fruit payout. Spiteri now trains a chimp named Judy how to work the device. Sorry for this. On her own, she would never work it out. But thanks to a sweet liquid reward, she learns the sequence's two steps. Rotate, then push. Next, Judy's group mates enter. Spiteri wants to know if, just by watching, the spectators will learn the technique. Can these apes ape to win this food-finding game? One chimp seems to think she's got it and shoves Judy aside. A minute ago, Judy was the only one with the knowledge. Now, another has it, and quickly the trick spreads throughout. You get the idea. And, uh, and then this is a, a work from uh, Derek Lyons, where uh, he studies how early this is in children, where children, instead of going, uh, who are smart enough uh, in the in task given, instead of going straight for a reward, like a chimp would do, actually over-imitate and do unnecessary steps because that's how they were, were trained. And uh, here's an example of it. So all, all this is not necessary. And then open the drawer there where the, there's a reward. So now the kid gets to do it. <laughs> I love this. So, so uh, we, we mirror, we imitate, we spread uh, this uh, simulated uh, state. We communicate in so many, in many ways. And this picture just, uh, to me, captures the exact mirroring. Uh, this was the Pope Paul's of, uh, famous cardinal assistant who name I can't remember right now. But uh, he must have known every, every move, every felt behavior and the like. So. Uh, so can we take this uh, up to the question, of, do we have an immoral sense as a species? And if so, do we recognize and accept it on our own terms? And what, I, what I'm trying to get at here is, it, we, let's say the idea to kill or murder or not to kill or not to murder, is that not a good idea because our species doesn't actually think it's a good idea or is it because of received wisdom from a, a religious setting uh, or what have you? And uh, uh, so the question is, are there moral instincts that we all have, this, this teeming mass of 6.7 billion who more or less get along? Are we really relying on uh, uh, lessons learned uh, at our mother's knee 
or in fact, uh, are we just built not to respond to some situations as to, uh, and more to others? And this was really kicked off in 2001 in an experiment I'll mention in a minute by uh, Green and Cohen, but it was, ex uh, it was extended to, the, to examine the question across many cultures by Mark Hauser and his colleagues uh, at Harvard. And uh, they take this classic problem that, that many of you know and uh, wanted to ask, do all people in the culture kind of respond the, the same way, the world culture? And so what they do is they would propose this moral judgment on them. Uh, and the uh, first one was the problem of, of, uh, of Denise, who is a passenger on a train whose driver has fainted on the main on the main track ahead are five people. The main track has a side track leading off to the right, and Denise can turn the train onto it. There's one person on the right-hand track. Denise can turn the train, killing one, and basically saving the other five. This is a famous trolley problem. And uh, you, you give this problem to the peoples of the world, no matter where they live, what their age, and what have you, and 89% of them come back that it's okay for Denise to pull the lever, kill the one, and let the five uh, live. And then uh, you uh, change the problem a little bit, and uh, it goes like this. Frank is on a footbridge over the train tracks. It seems he sees a train approaching the bridge out of control. There are five people on the track. Frank knows the only way to stop the train is to drop a heavy weight onto the path, but the only available sufficiently heavy weight is a large man uh, also watching the train from the footbridge. Frank can shove the man over and uh, kill him and save the fine. Is that okay to do? And only 11% of the people of the world say that that's okay. Now, you ask these people why they have this response, whether they're in either case, and they all give you, I mean, there's a wide variety of explanations for why they have that way. But the, uh, the scientist looking at this doesn't really care about the explanation. It's not, in fact, with our interpreter idea, we would predict they'd all have different ideas why they don't do that, but if there is actually just a basic response that pours out of our species on such kinds of dilemmas, uh, yeah, you, you wouldn't be surprised. And so, um, as I said, uh, Green, uh, Joshua Green out at Harvard and, and others at Princeton uh, uh, basically did this test in a brain imaging environment and on the case where you have the person being physically touched and pushed into the uh, path of the train, there is a lighting up of the emotional system of the brain that is uh, basically absent in the other, other condition. So there are kind of moral breaks that sort of, as it were, come on and stop us from carrying out uh, these activities. And the notion, therefore, is that these things are, uh, there, there may be moral schemas of all kinds uh, that are built into us, and, uh, and they're just there. And we may give the, uh, an interpretation as to why they are, but the underlying biology is clear. So um, <clears throat> that was work was extended by uh, Damasio and his group, where they took patients uh, and examined uh, a group of patients that uh, have uh, prefrontal lobe lesions, and therefore an interference with the no normal emotional processing uh, of information. And what he discovered in these patients is that you can give them a task like uh, a question like, is it okay to uh, uh, murder your boss? And everybody, the people with the lesion and without the lesion would say, no, that's ridiculous, that's crazy. But then there's sort of, sort of a low conflict situation. But in a high conflict situation where you ask people, uh, is it okay, uh, you take a war scene and troops are outside and, and uh, there's a baby crying and the baby will reveal the 10 people that are hiding from the soldiers. Is it okay to smother the baby to save the, whole, the other 10 and so forth? Those kinds of high conflict situations, the people who do not have uh, 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 any lesion, the, the normal controls, are immediately in high conflict, their reaction time goes way up and they respond totally different whereas the people with the inability to process emotional information kind of just breeze along and come out with a, uh, a practical uh, solution. So the notion uh, uh, is very powerful that these processes are involved in guiding our judgments in these uh, moral domains uh, all the time. 
And the work has been extended to think that, well, there's, there's other mental, there are other moral systems, other moral questions. And uh, so the, the question is, do, the, do we have rules and do we have special modules and we're trying to figure out the moral stance of others and manipulate it one way or the other. We're trying to figure out and have a social understanding and predicting the beliefs, belief of others. And this work was uh, really put forth and, and argued uh, very effectively uh, and demonstrated by Rebecca, Rebecca Sachs uh, at MIT. And uh, this is the simulation model, boy, you know, uh, but that really hurts. Uh, as you would look at someone under an injury and you could begin to feel it through a, a simulation. But what about if you're trying to manipulate their thought, their thoughts, and their, their, their beliefs, and uh, you, uh, look at uh, our favorite financier, uh, and as he says, I, I, you know, he says, I bet I can make some money off that guy over there. That is trying to get into the other person's thought and predict how he's going to respond. It's, it's recognizing the mental state of another and thinking about it uh, at that level. And she proposed that that's a different, completely different mechanism, different brain areas than from the ones that are trying to simulate uh, how we feel about other people. And so uh, in predicting the mental states of others, she made use of a, of a test that has been well developed now in, in, in developmental uh, psychology called uh, the false belief task. And I've made it a, 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 a cartoon here uh, that, uh, or emphasize a classic cartoon because this is the hardest thing to follow, but I think I've got it licked here. If I trip up, You'll let me know about it, right? Anyway, two people are in a room, uh, Mary and Sally, and they're standing there, and there's people, the, this uh, little group of people down at the bottom indicate just uh, babies uh, looking and young children looking at this game. So Mary and Sally are in a room, and then uh, uh, Mary goes ahead and, uh, uh, or, no, I guess it's Sally. See, there you go. Sally's the one. Sally hides the ball. Okay, and she hides it in the basket and watch it. See, she hit it. Oh, go away, ball. Okay, then Sally leaves the room. Okay, Sally leaves the room. Anne gets up, goes over, gets the ball from the basket, and moves it to the box. Okay, you got it? Anne moves the ball to the box. This crowd down front's watching all of this all the time. And the question we're going to ask them, where do they think uh, Sally will think the ball is when she comes back in the room? So sure enough, Sally comes back in the room and the kids have to ask the question, where do they think the ball is? And uh, <clears throat> what happens is that if you're four or under, they all think it's in the box. They cannot believe that someone can hold a false belief until the age of five, and then the rest of our life, we know about all these sort of things. So it, the, the notion was that you, it is a system that comes online, there is a, a mechanism, a special mechanism for figuring out the belief state of others. And uh, uh, Sachs uh, did these studies again in the brain imaging environment, environment and finds out there's an area in the, in the right hemisphere called the uh, uh, temporal parietal junction that is activated when subjects think about the beliefs of others. That's when it gets uh, activated and lit up, as we say. And under many conditions, when explicitly told someone's belief in writing, following loose direction to consider another's belief, when instructed to predict actions of someone else uh, holding a fall base. This particular parts of the part of the brain is activated for that. So, uh, if this is true, and now I'm turning you all into uh, experimental scientists, if, for those of you who've been during this lectures, if this is true, uh, you should see a, we should see some kind of disruption of this in split brain patients and people that have the hemispheres disconnected. If the information about others can't get to the, the hemisphere that is doing the language and speaking and problem solving, uh, there should be problems in their moral uh, capacity. And uh, we, in fact, uh, did this work. Uh, my colleagues, excuse me, Michael Miller, uh, uh, Leanne Young, uh, uh, Walter Sun and Armstrong, and many others, uh, we, we took split brain patient and uh, split brain patients, and the notion, again, being uh, developed first by Sachs, 
that belief attribution centers are over in the uh, right hemisphere, and we know goal representation uh, uh, of others is in the left, that should make for some moral reasoning disrupted if these people's brain is divided. So you do an experiment. And the experiment takes, makes use of the following kinds of questions. Uh, this woman uh, decides to make coffee uh, and, uh, for her boss, and she puts sugar in it and uh, gives the coffee to her boss, and the boss dies because the sugar was, in fact, toxic. It wasn't sugar. But she believed that it was sugar, but nonetheless, uh, she was wrong, and as a result, the, 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 uh, the boss dies. And we're going to call that accidental harm, and you give this to a patient. You give, I give it to you, give it to anybody, give it to a subject, and the question is, is the action permissible? And most everybody would say, well, yes, because she thought, she thought that it was okay, so it shouldn't be forbidden. Now, what about believing when it is wrong, but uh, believing it is wrong when it is right? So now, uh, our friend uh, actually would like to bump the boss off and uh, thinks what she's putting in there is a toxic substance, gives the coffee to her boss, the boss drink it, drinks it, and he's fine, because in fact, uh, it was sugar. And so here you have a case where there's a failed attempt, and the question is, is the action uh, permissible. We would have said, no, it's not permissible because you had the intent of killing, but uh, the, actually the outcome was good. So uh, the implications are, is a listener to these stories only going to be concerned about the outcome or will they be judging on the basis of the beliefs of the actor? So again, separating uh, these brain areas from each other should lead us to uh, examining that question. And uh, this was done in a series of, of patients who were both fully split and involved uh, uh, also patients with partial split, but where the split included the areas that, uh, that disconnect the temporal parietal uh, junction. And uh, what you wind up with is a very uh, uh, interesting result that, uh, of course, normal subjects uh, base their judgment on whether it's permissible or not based on the beliefs of the agent, uh, the, you know, what was their intent. And uh, the split brain patients uh, do it completely uh, based on outcomes. Was there any harm or not? Uh, whether something was permissible or forbidden. So, uh, so consequences of an outcome decision yet with real world knowledge. What, I mean, th these patients are utterly normal and everywhere our interpreter comes to the rescue. Uh, so an example here is from one of the cases, uh, JW, uh, after hearing a scenario in which a waitress knowingly serves sesame seeds to somebody she believes is highly allergic to them, yet the outcome was positive because the person turned out not to be allergic, J.W. said, judge the action to be permissible. And then he added, moments later, sesame seeds are just little tiny things, they are not going to hurt you. There's many, many examples now of, uh, let me see what I've done here, yeah, okay. Yeah, so there's, there's many, many examples of uh, how people are very cleverly unearthing the mechanisms of various moral circuits involved in processing of information. And uh, uh, I'll, I'm just going to, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip this one and go to the question. From, from judgments to explanations, we have many innate responses. The, the big view I'm trying to sell you here is we have many innate responses to our social world. Automatic empathy, impl uh, implicit evaluation of others, and emotional reactions all inform our moral judgments. Yet we typically do not think about those responses nor appeal to them when explaining our decisions. Humans act commonly on moral challenges but claim different reasons for doing so. Why is this? Well, uh, a theme that you've certainly heard a lot about for me is that the, what happens is there's this cacophony of influences guiding our behaviors and our judgments on things. They, are, they involve emotional systems, they involve these special moral judgment systems, and the behavior pours out, and then we give it an interpretation. And that interpretation becomes a, a very meaningful part of our life, but it may be that they're really what's governing our response to these things are these universal properties that we all have. And so, uh, 
Uh, understanding our personal moral stance, I would say, since it appears we all share the same moral networks and systems, and since we do all respond in similar ways to similar issues, then the only thing that is different is not our behavior, but our theories about why we respond the way we do. Understanding that our theories are the source of our conflicts would go a long way, it seems to me, and this is the point, in helping people with different belief systems to get along. If you look at someone's interpretation of why they do something, you say, fine, I'm glad you think that. That's why you do it. But if you have a deeper understanding, it seems to me that you probably just don't do that or you do do it because that's the way we are structured as, as members of the human species. So uh, to conclude, I would say that uh, social brains and social change, our brains uh, has evolved neural circuitry that enables us to thrive in a social context. And now the big question is, our social context changes through the accumulation of knowledge about our very nature. How might that change how we want to live and experience our social life, especially with justice and punishment? So in my last lecture on Thursday, I hope to bring this issue and raise these questions and how we would play out our maybe changed understanding of the morals, our, our moral behavior uh, in the judicial system. So I will be examining uh, the question of how neuroscience will impact the law. Thank you. Right, so let's begin with questions. Um, there is a cordless microphone going around. If you do have a question, raise your hand, and I will do my best to keep track. So we have one question here from the gentleman in a sitting there. Thank you. I wonder if you could go back to near the beginning of today's talk uh, when you were discussing the theory, uh, the theories of mind aspect of things. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and uh, it seems entirely plausible. The positive side of this is entirely clear and straightforward. You know, it's what we do. But you asserted and didn't have time to talk about that it's only us who have this. Mm -hmm. And that seems a little more surprising to me in the sense that just naively, it seems the case that, that lots of animals have what appear to be expectations about other people's, other entities' behavior. And when those expectations are, don't play out, mm -hmm. they're surprised. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not an, ex uh, an experimental psychologist, but is there nothing like that? Are you, is that the, the burden of what you're suggesting? Uh, th this has been a uh, lively, intellectually uh, active, and passionate field for about the last 20, 15 years now. And uh, there are plenty of people who would uh, uh, have taken that position, did take that position that you just stated. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the bulk of the evidence now suggests that they, the animals do not have a theory of mind. They have, a, they have a conditioned expectancies, they have all kinds of things, but they do not have an actual theory about the other person. And, uh, uh, so the, the the big animal where this was thought uh, where it was thought that they were going to find this was the chimpanzee, and there was there's been a large and active debate on whether it does. And I and I would say actually in fairness the debate still continues. Uh, but if you look at it uh, in the, in, in uh, at least as I looked at it in detail, I think the people who demonstrate who've done a series of experiments to demonstrate that they don't are winning. And so that's why I summarized it that way. But uh, you put your finger on a point that uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, did draw attention, is still continuing to draw attention. I just think there's a winner. <laughs> Would it take too long to give us some sense of what such an experiment was like, or is that going to take us too far afield? It's your, your uh, call. No, Thank you. It, I just can't think of it right now. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, it, believe me, if I could, I would be short. So uh, I, I just can't think of what, what, what particular experiments uh, the man who did them, uh, uh, to a large extent, did the bulk of the work is a man named uh, Dan Polvinelli at the uh, Chimp Center at, at, at uh, University of Louisiana. And I just can't think of the particular test. And, and Premack himself, who came up with the theory of mind, has some negative cases too, and, and I, I just don't have them in my head. Thank you. I, I Thank apologize. You. So question here at the front from Andy Clark. Thank you. 
So, so the only bit that I, I wasn't too clear about, I think, is why the, the moral schemas, as I think you called them, had to be built in. Because, you know, there could be quite a lot of, of pressure on moral and social systems to evolve in certain ways. Yeah. Um, they would then, if you like, enforce certain sorts of common outcome. Wouldn't that be enough to, to explain uh, the, the data there? I, 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 I mean, I think in, in, the truth of the matter is that there's both systems, that, that they're, they're going to be primitive moral systems. Yeah, I'm going to show you evidence uh, on uh, Thursday uh, about uh, uh, how a reciprocity, retribution, all these things are built in in babies. And uh, so I, I'm just saying that there, we're going to find out, we're going to get that list, and then we're going to find this other list of stuff that we just can't explain that way. And there's obviously going to be dependent on learning from uh, social contingencies and all the rest. But, but you know, prior to these clever tests that are going on in developmental biology and, go, and, go, and developmental psychology and in brain imaging, you couldn't, you couldn't get to the biology of it. It was just an argument. And what's happened in the last years is that there's now real weight on the fact about how much of this is built in. I guess I was sort of wondering how, whether it really deserves the title moral schema, the built-in stuff, you know, just a sort of tendency to fall into line. Well, that's a philosopher. You see, uh, you're, uh, it may not, but... Uh, <laughs> we have a question, gentlemen, at the back. Uh, yes, please, that's fine. That is you. Can I uh, take you to the latter part of your, paper, uh, your presentation to see if you can help me to make sure I understood what you were saying? Mm -hmm. uh, I may well not have understood accurately. It seemed to me that toward the end of your talk you were tending in the direction of, or could be taken as tending in the direction of a rather sanguine attitude about human moral capabilities. And it seems to me that the history of human behavior suggests that there may be good reason not to be quite so sanguine about our innate tendencies. Um, did I misunderstand you? Because it, it, it seems to me that quite a lot of social conditioning seems necessary in order to achieve certain moral behaviors that, uh, uh, that, that have been prized at certain times, but, but not by others. I mean, certain, certain societies are perfectly okay to kill people of another tribe. You just don't kill people of your own tribe or, or whatever. And those are, those are given profound moral approbation. I mean, yeah. So um, there is definitely a trend in human culture to, uh, to have a reduction in violence. This is the very topic of a, a new book by uh, Steven Pinker, Pinker coming out on violence. And there has been, there's been a, just a, a radical draw off on how, drop off in how humans uh, deal uh, with situations. There's, a, there's no arguing that point. But uh, still, uh, Everything is so amplified by our understanding of uh, our fellow man by, by the evening news, by the bad guys who are really bad and do terrible things. You, you, can't, you can't lose track of the fact that most of us don't behave that way. And it's astounding. And why is that? And look beyond uh, the sense of violence. I mean, violence is so uh, attention uh, grabbing and it's so upsetting, it's so captivating, and, and as we uh, move into our modern uh, way of life, uh, uh, just so troubling, that uh, we think it's all over the place. Well, in fact, it isn't all over the place. And the, the homicide rates are, are minor in our, our species. Um, uh, oddly, the, one of the highest rates is down the street here in Glasgow until recently. Uh, but we don't, as a species, kill each other. And, and, and if you can talk about the 10 in 100,000 that, that commit homicide, if you want it, that does happen. But you're forgetting the bulk of how our species responds. And I think these uh, insights that are coming along, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, raise an optimistic uh, uh, flag. Uh, I may be wrong, but I'm an optimist anyway. So. We have time for one last question, gentlemen at the front, here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Professor, see if I got this right. The interpreter lives in the left brain, gathers data, makes theories. Are you suggesting that the moral uh, universal universalities, which could be 
leading us into nature versus nurture, live in the right brain? Uh, that's a fair question. Uh, so I, I said that this particular one of uh, appreciating the mental state of another person seems to be uh, highly in involving of, of the right temporal parietal junction. That's, that's what the data showed. And I found it utterly surprising when I learned that. But of course, in the normal brain with the interpreter working, it doesn't matter where stuff is, it all is gonna get out in the wash. It's all going to get brought together and calculated. So it turns out it happens to be that aspect of, uh, of, uh, of knowledge that would be applied to a moral question happens to be centered in the right hemisphere. Another one, the slide I jumped by, uh, is involves the right frontal lobe. And this has to do with uh, uh, the uh, ability to uh, judge fairness. So there's this game the economists call uh, the ultimatum game, and you know how it goes. And for those of you who don't, uh, one person has uh, 20 bucks, and uh, he gets to say one thing, either 19, 18, 17, down to one. And the other person in the room gets to only say one thing, yes or no. So the economists have been fascinated by the fact that our species does not respond by rational choice in this, that whatever this person says with the 20 books, the other person should say yes to, because that's it, the game's over, everybody goes home. So if you want anything out of this deal, you would say yes, right? Well, what happens is we don't. We have to get up to seven or eight bucks, whatever it is, before we'll say yes, because it's just not fair otherwise, okay? Well, so that's the basic observation. And then uh, Ernst Fair and his colleagues in Switzerland and others uh, now st stimulate all, all around the brain, and they find a particular area in the right frontal lobe, and you stimulate that, it moves that value up and down, and only if you stimulate in that place. So, so what contributes to all of these uh, things that go into uh, the variety of moral judgments we make all the time? Um, I, they look like they're distributed all over the place. And if you interfere with them, it's going to have an impact on uh, the interpreter, as we showed in that split brain experiment. That's great. Uh, Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.